Hello and welcome to the Football Hipsters podcast. We're doing another interview and this time I'm joined by a guest we've had on previously. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome back to the podcast Mr John Driscoll. Uh, hey Tom, good to be here mate. Good, good, good to hear. Um, we'll go straight into it and there's not many other places we can start seeing as recording the night or the morning after the Copa del Rey final. Um, what did you think of the match overall? Um, it was you know, a slight disappointment, wasn't it, in that um, it took a while to get the goals. It was it was intriguing. It was fascinating. It was probably a, an example of football but sometimes being really good, perhaps not being at its most exciting at the same time. Uh, I think Sevilla probably missed an opportunity, really. Once they, once Barca were down to 10 men, Mascherano sent off. Um, they probably should have gone for it, which in a way, I think, encapsulates how they play. It almost sums up their whole season. I know they got to the Copa del Rey final. I know they won the Europa League for the third time in a row, so that's brilliant. But um, they shouldn't have finished seventh in the league. They're better than that. Um, and I think, uh, I think if Emery's got one problem it's that he's over cautious and I think that was summed up there but credit to Barcelona you know bear in mind they played for uh, you know a, a long long time of that game played for 50 odd minutes a man down to come back and win shows you what a what a brilliant team they are yeah I certainly think so and I mean it's a credit also severe thinking that um, obviously say with the the Europa League final and they played again a few days later in, in another final so to play at the level that both teams did was, was impressive I mean we'll stick with Barcelona quickly um, obviously they, they won the league um, and they had that sort of dip in form towards the end of the season I mean personally I, I mean it's pretty obvious that was more down to fatigue and, uh, and obviously they've got a small squad as well when you think about it so are you impressed with how they did this season? I mean, obviously the Champions League crash out was a bit of a disappointment, but ultimately was it a successful season? Yeah, I think so. I mean, they won the domestic double, so you've got to say that. And they they lost uh, over two games to Atletico, which is no shame. So yeah, it, it, it's a great season. I don't think it will be a particularly memorable or famous one for for Barcelona. Uh, last season, uh, obviously they were all conquering in the second half of last season. I think he made some tactical mistakes in terms of a lack of rotation. You could almost argue that he got a little bit lucky last season because he was making all of those changes in the first half of the season. He was really under pressure, wasn't he, after that uh, defeat last January against Real Sociedad and decided to stick with his best team as, as far as he could for the rest of the season. And they swept all before them in the, in the, in the running. Um, I wondered whether for the first half of this season he might make more changes. Um, he didn't. They also played, obviously, went to Japan and won the, the World Club Cup as well. So that was another demand on them. No one's ever retained the Champions League. And I think that's one of the factors, isn't it? It's very hard to do. They've decided to set up their squad this way, haven't they? They've, they've only, they, 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 are, they are a rich club. There are richer clubs around. They've poured an awful lot of money into a relatively small group of players. And so the sacrifice that you're making is that uh, it, it's a big demand on those players. It was no surprise that it came after the international break when their South American players had been away. And so yeah, that's the demands. Um, they got 91 points, not as many as they've got uh, in previous seasons. They won the league by just the one point. They were pushed all the way, but they were pushed all the way by two really good teams, Real Madrid and Atletico Madrid, obviously the, the two in the, the Champions League final. So, you know, Barcelona have done well to, to beat them both off again. And, I, I, you know, it's a good season for Barcelona. Not their best, but very, very good. It's, it's, you, you're being picky, aren't you, if you're saying they could have done better? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those teams where you, have to, where you look at them more critically, cause obviously, because of the, the success they've had. So, I mean, if we look at, the, the obviously, the counterpart in the Copa del Rey, Sevilla, what I find intriguing is that a team that's now won the Europa League three times in a row, in the league, they couldn't win away all season, which is... Amazing, and a lot of people, as obviously I'm involved with a lot of Arsenal social media on Twitter, and a lot of people have been saying they've been wanting Unai Emery as Arsenal manager um, to replace Wenger when he goes. However, a manager who cannot win away in the legal season is certainly a worrying aspect. Yeah, they, they've made decisions though, Sevilla, haven't they? They've set up their squad. They've got this big squad with uh, two good players in every position is, is the thought of it. They use the whole squad. It's almost as, though, as if the whole thing is designed to win the Europa League, isn't it? Which is a, a curious way to go. It's a remarkable achievement to win the Europa League three years in a row. Uh, I can't see it ever being done again um, because normally if a, team is on the, if a team is that good, they're normally on the up, aren't they? And so they, therefore, uh, after a season or two of winning the Europa League, you would imagine they're going to start making an impact on the Champions League. They're, they're already back in to win the Europa League because they finished third in their Champions League group, obviously because of qualifying for the Champions League. And so you're always up against it. It's just remarkable that they've decided to, to target it, which which if you look at their league selections towards the end of the season, and, and frankly, throughout the season, coming into Europa League games, there were times at which they were throwing 
almost throwing league points away, uh, which is not unusual. They did it a couple of years ago when they were up against um, Athletic Bilbao, weren't they racing for a place in the Champions League? And they made the decision to go um, and to, to target the Europa League, put stronger teams out in the Europa League and sacrifice the Champions League uh, position. That was a couple of years ago when you didn't have the, the place in the Europa League, the, the Champions League place for the Europa League team. So they've targeted that. They've made that decision. Uh, for all it's brilliant to win the Europa League three years in a row, I would like to see them properly really pour their resources into finishing as high up the, the league as they can and see if they can make an impact from the top three. I suspect what they've done is look at how strong the top three are and made a, a pragmatic decision that we're not that good. Let's concentrate on the Cups. Yeah, I think so. I mean, they finished seventh in the league, obviously. And I mean, it was a, a huge risk when you think about it with trying to win the Europa League. Cause if they hadn't have done, obviously they they wouldn't have been in the Champions League next season because of, of how it works and that. But it's, they, 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 won, they, they won it, so they're in the Champions League next season. But is it going to be another case, do you think, of they'll probably end up dropping down into the Europa League again? Or is it completely dependent on who they get in their group, obviously? It's hard to say, isn't it? It's hard to predict that a team is going to finish third in a group, isn't it? Because, you know, the, the draw has a big effect on it. A little bit of luck here and there, which is why it is so remarkable that they uh, have managed to, to retain the Europa League in those circumstances. Um, they they qualified for the Copa del Rey final pretty early, don't they? Because they, the semi-finals are done early in Spain, uh, done in February. So they always knew they had that little bit of a back uh, a backup there. As it happened, the teams in mid-table, there was a big gap for much of the season between seventh and eighth. So they had that little cushion that there was a way back into Europe, finishing top seven. And they obviously decided that Villarreal were too far away to really chase them down. They ended up 12 points behind Villarreal even though Villarreal really collapsed towards the end of the season as well. Um, they, they should. I, I really hope that Sevilla really targeted at, at least Champions League qualification yeah. through yeah. the top four. But then, oh, I don't know, I don't know. You know, the, the romantic in you says it's about winning trophies. Who cares who finishes fourth? You don't remember who finished fourth in a particular season a couple yeah. of years down the line, do you? Yeah, exactly. And it segues nicely into a question we was actually asked on Twitter from at Welsh Gunas. So there's no prizes for guessing who he supports. Um, <laughs> and that is, you mentioned about Sevilla could be challenging those top three and he asked who do you think is the next team that could be challenging those top three for a, for a place in the, for the title uh for the title well it should have been it uh, leads us into a discussion about valencia i guess this doesn't it because i think if you asked me this question 12 months ago i'd have said valencia would be the one to mm. to have a proper crack at it and what an absolute hash they've made of their season 44 points they ended up with i think that's if i remember i think they got 77 last season so it's, it's yeah. an incredible Amazing. drop off in points, isn't it? When you'd have also said, because they mainly, most of their signings were done the season before. So they signed a load of young players. They overpaid for them. We, we you know, we were pretty clear. Um, the people who watch La Liga all the time say, you know, they've been taken for a ride. Peter Lim got taken for a ride by George Mendes, signing too many players for too much money, uh, all from, or virtually all from the George Mendes uh, stable. Uh, so the signings were bad. Uh, it all got focused, all that discontent from the fans got focused on Nuno, who was the coach. Wrongly, he was he was a Mendes man. He wasn't perhaps the best coach they could have had, but he was the best one they had because he was the one that was there. He knew those players. He got forced out. They made the incredible decision to uh, recruit Gary Neville. Um, everything was stacked up against him. It wasn't a league he knew. He didn't know the language. He didn't have any experience. What did you expect would happen? Uh, they got themselves in a relegation battle and ended up getting Paco Ayesteran in to try and drag them away from a relegation battle. They finished six points clear. Of, of a relegation battle when they should have been. You know, you, you'd say if they were six points behind Atletico in third, you'd have said, yeah, fair enough. Maybe slightly disappointing. So they've got a long way to go, Valencia. Um, there are really good teams in there. Uh, Villarreal, I think, probably hit a peak um, at the moment. I think they need a bit of work to do. Celta Vigo, likewise. Sevilla are the ones who could really make an impact. Atletico Bilbao are a strong team. Those teams have got to make a decision, though. Athletic are similar to Sevilla in that they've got to decide what they're going to target. Athletic played about 60 games this season because they were in the Europa League early. They went for it properly. Um, if, they, if they're really going to make a, a crack at the top three, uh, they, they need to really pour, pour their efforts into La Liga. Yeah, certainly agree. Um, moving to the actual one of the title challenges, Real Madrid. Um, they're obviously in the Champions League final, but they just fell short in the league. Couldn't really take advantage of the slight slump in, in Barcelona's form. Um, Zizou coming in, I mean, he's completely changed the, the dynamic in, in, in the way they're played in terms of they're, they're much more compact and, in my my uh, opinion, more more defensive-minded uh, when they hit on the counter-attack and that. So do you think he's, he's coming in and certainly improved what Rafa Benitez started? 
Oh, yeah, undoubtedly. If you look at the, the, the points gained first half of the season to second half of the season, there's no doubt about it. Um, it's, 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 it's one of the funny things about football, though, isn't it? So much about uh, people's perception, because the, the kind of things that uh, Zidane has done successfully, I think if Rafa had tried to do those ones, he would have been, he would have been howled down, wouldn't he? Because in, in a sense, Rafa's got this reputation as a boring defensive coach. And yet he was the one in the big games who didn't put Casemiro, their, their only really defensive-minded midfielder. Uh, into into the games. They got hammered in, in El Clasico doing that. He never had the authority. No one ever wanted Benitez. And so he was he was always drinking from a, a poison chalice because of that. Uh, I don't think he did an awful lot. Yeah, he did make mistakes, but it, it was never going to work. So it was always good then for Zidane to come in. What I really, really hope for from Real Madrid's point of view is that he has the authority to say to Florentino Perez, I don't want any more Galacticos. I don't think this is the way to go. It would be interesting, wouldn't it, if, if Paul Pogba's people ring up uh, Florentino Perez and says, look, Paul really wants to come and sign for you. Uh, will they blow their whole summer's transfer budget on Paul Pogba, who's a brilliant player, who would all love to see playing in La Liga? Um, or do, do they get sensible? Do they sign Krakowiak and do they sign you know, a slightly better defensive midfielder than Casemiro? Uh, do they sign... Uh, a bit of a, a decent pacey central defender as a bit of cover for the players they've got now and and maybe push uh, Pepe further to the side. That kind of sensible, pragmatic decision looks as though it's what Zidane wants to do, isn't it? Because he has been sensible. It hasn't been a fancy Dan team. He wasn't a fancy Dan player, was he, to be fair? He was a massively talented player, but he stuck his clog in on, famously on, on, on occasions. And he learned, you know, he, he was schooled in his coaching in France, where they, they it's pretty defensive-minded, pragmatic coaching. He played for Juventus for a lot of years. You know, he, he's not some ball juggler, Zinedine Zidane. Um, I, I think he did a terrific job for an inexperienced coach. It's a whole other uh, issue again, isn't it, as to, as to how... Because obviously they've got the, the transfer ban to manage, so it looks as though that the, the, they will have a summer to sign at the moment. Um, big calls to be made. He's an inexperienced coach. So there's, there's still a lot, a lot of questions as to whether he'll get the team ready for a, a, a crack at Barcelona. They fell one point short. You know, they, they, they weren't far away and they're in the European uh, Cup final. It, it could yet turn out to be a brilliant season. Yeah, certainly. Um, the next team, obviously, is Atletico Madrid. And they'll be, they'll be playing Real Madrid in the Champions League final. Now, what I find interesting about some Real Madrid fans I've been speaking to is, is that they're quite confident. But what I've looked at is, is the routes that both teams have taken to the final. And Real Madrid, I mean, it's probably a bit of a slight on the Champions League, but you have to say their route's been quite easy, if you think about it, on the way to the Champions League. Obviously, they've had Wolfsburg, and then they've had Manchester City in the semi-final. And, and Atletico, on the other hand, have had Bayern and Barcelona. It's quite a contrast. I mean, is it probably one of the easiest routes you've seen a, a club take to the final? Uh, well, they had to play Malmo, you know, Tom. That was, that was a close <laughs> one thing, wasn't it? I mean, did, uh, we did um, Ronaldo score that day. Um, they, yeah, it's 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 fallen nicely. It doesn't mean that um, they're not favourites to win it, though. Uh, Real does it quite often. You look at a team and they get an easy route to the final, and then they go on and win it. We saw it in the uh, the FA Cup. Manchester United had a much easier run to the FA Cup final, didn't they? Then in the early stages, than uh, Crystal Palace had had. Uh, Atletico, if Atletico win it, you're absolutely right. I mean, what what a triumph that would be! The teams that they will have defeated along the way. Uh, they are some team Atletico, aren't they? It's absolutely, it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, there was a point a couple of years ago at which people very uh, casually took the the two oh, it's a two team league, it's a two horse two, two horse race La Liga. You can't say that anymore because uh, Atletico have won the league more recently than than Real Madrid. You know, in the last eight seasons, uh, Real Madrid have won it once. It's not a two horse race for the La Liga titles. Un- un- undoubtedly, there are three teams that can win it. They've been brilliant, Atletico. They've consolidated um, what was what could have been a flash in the pan a couple of years ago. He came in in 2012. He improved them steadily. You might have thought that 2014 would be a peak when they lost you know, in the last minutes or so. They lost their lead of the, the Champions League final. They won the league that season. They looked absolutely exhausted as they almost collapsed over the line, got hammered in extra time. But they've come back. They've got young players. Uh, I don't think they'll be massively affected by uh, the transfer ban because their team is young, their squad is young, obviously, with uh, uh, reju- rejuvenated uh, Torres. You have to uh, make an exception for and Gabby, but generally it's a pretty young, strong team. Uh, they've done brilliantly um, because they don't spend anything like the money uh, that uh, the other two spend. It is all based around uh, a team ethic, brilliant tactics, uh, brilliant coach. I'm not sure that Simeone would translate elsewhere. And I think at the moment, sensibly, it looks as though I think he accepts that he is he's the the square peg in the in the square hole 
at uh, Atletico, and it's where he should stay. Yeah, I agree. Um, again, segue very nicely into the next part, but I wanted to quickly highlight. Um, a lot of people have said that the Premier League is is the most is the best league in the world for its competitiveness and, and, and the way you get shocks in, in many games. Anyone can beat anyone. Well, this season you could argue that the title race in Spain was, was the best across Europe in the, in the top leagues. The, even the relegation battle, which we'll come on to later, was, was very entertaining. And obviously we've seen Leicester win the league in the Premiership, which is a huge shock. But a team which shocked me in La Liga this season was Celta Vigo. Um, obviously they finished sixth. Um, the, I really thought they would drop off because of the style and the, the high tempo and, and pressing style that Barizo brought in. Um, how how like, shocked were you at Celta Vigo's rise up the league this season? I wouldn't say shocked because I thought they were a, a, a good team last season. They had a massive dip last season. They beat Barcelona and then uh, had a collapse in form. What they've done really well is is to lose players. They lost uh, Augusto, who was who was a crucial player to them, but they've still managed to to, to rebuild. Um, if I were a, a, a club president or chairman, I'd be having a very close look at uh, Eduardo Barito because I think he's done a brilliant job uh, with Celta Vigo to improve them from where Luis Enrique had left them. They play stylish football. Um, will they finish sixth again next season? I guess not because, uh, first of all, they've got to hang on to Nolito. He's getting older. Oriano was crucial. Again, getting older. Um, they would have an, another lot of work to do to, to finish where they finish uh, they haven't got a, it's not a massive club, Celta Vigo, with, with all due respect to it, as we say. Um, it doesn't have a massive fan base. Um, they're, they've done brilliantly. They're good to watch. It's an entertaining team. In terms of the, the other point that you made about where we look at La Liga as a whole, I mean, obviously La Liga is the stronger league at the moment. I, I, you, know, you don't need to have a full understanding of the UEFA coefficients to, to understand that. The last three seasons, both European trophies have been won by Spanish clubs. And we know that that's this, this season, uh, including because we know that the Champions League will go to Spain again. So, you know, there, there is no other marker uh, of that. The, the, the top end of the league, it is, it is stronger. Um, you do get, you know, people say there are no easy games in the Premier League. Have you seen Aston Villa play would be a very simple thing. I think we'd be looking, if, if Barcelona played Aston Villa, we'd be looking at big scores in that kind of game. That, that does happen. What the Premier League's had this season is that, fabulous, unbelievable story of, of Leicester City. It hasn't particularly been an interesting Premier League, has it, in truth? Because they won it by was it a dozen points in the end. If that had been any other... T- if it had been Chelsea winning the league by a dozen points with a load of 1-0 wins in the, in the, in the run-in, uh, it would have been down as, as, as a really dull season, especially with no relegation battle in the last week of the season, whereas mm. Spain had a relegation battle, it had a title battle. Um, it, uh, the reason it won't go down as a particularly memorable season is that Barcelona hit the front and no one could quite catch them. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, if we move on to another team that that impressed me, I wouldn't certainly not at the start of the season, but their recovery's been been quite impressive. Is Malaga? Um, the team were obviously in in a rut at the start of the season, in, in the bottom three, and and obviously when we spoke last time, we spoke about Camacho's return and what he brought to the midfield. Um, they they have continued their form. Obviously, there's been a couple of a couple of losses and dips in form, but ultimately they they've managed to get eighth in the league, which is really impressive. And I mean, do you think they could aim for higher heights next season? I think that's going to be difficult, isn't it? It would be important for them to hang on to their players. Bear in mind they sold some good players last summer and and again in January because Amrabat was an important player to them. He's not the best and they've they've obviously shown that they didn't miss him too much. But if they go on selling good players again, the real danger that they lose Javi Garcia has been linked with jobs in Russia, isn't he, at the moment. So it's going to be another challenge for Malaga if Sheikh Altani doesn't decide to put an awful lot of money in, which the impressions are that uh, I don't think he's going to change his plan. They're not going to be piling a lot of money into it. They were the they were the best of the the mid table pack, weren't they? So you could you could argue that eighth is a little bit flattering, in that they're only ten points above Ray Vicano, who were relegated. Um, there's a lot of very similar level teams around the middle of La Liga. But yeah, you've got to say they've done brilliantly, haven't they? You know, you, I was I was thinking earlier about the likes of Wellington, who's is is in his mid to late thirties now. Yeah. They signed him on the cheap before they had any money. He was there throughout them having all the money and then losing it all again. Amazing. Amazing how well he's done. Amazing when you consider that at the start of the season, they didn't score for week after week after week until they played uh, David Moyes' uh, Real Sociedad. Uh, so to, you know, to, to sort themselves out, to finish eighth, to improve throughout the season, it has, yeah, they've, they've done brilliantly, Manica. Yeah, a, a player I like that came in, they brought in from Sociedad, was, was Castro to obviously replace Amrabat, and I thought he did well. But if we move on to, to the relegation battle, which really was quite something to watch this season. There were so many teams involved up until the last few weeks of the season. Um, 
finally, though, Hatafe have been relegated. <laughs> um, yes. It feels like it's been coming for a while. I mean, a lot of people look at Spain and see all those teams with their identities of their regions, and Hatafe have always been sort of in the Madrid shadow of, of, of a few clubs, obviously. I mean, is it a shame they've gone down, or is it just a time for another team to replace them and, and get their identity in the top league? If you'd asked me um, two months ago, I'd have said, yes, get rid of Hatafe because... Uh, obviously, as, as a commentator, you're not biased in terms of which team wins. You're biased in terms of you want a bit of atmosphere. It's mm. difficult to commentate when all you can see are empty seats. Uh, and it's not great for the image of La Liga because obviously, you, you know, when, when you work on La Liga, you, 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 are, you, you want it to be good. You want the world to look at it and think, oh, that's great, isn't it? And you go to Hetafe on a Friday night and there's empty mm. seats and voices ringing around of, of the coaching staff. And it's terrible. And then weirdly, I mean, that 10 years of that, the last few weeks, they suddenly get a pricing structure. They suddenly get people in cheap. And the, suddenly there were people dancing and singing and playing the instruments and, and jumping up and down. And you think, well, why, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you build something over, over the last, all those years that you've been in La Liga? It's not like, you know, I, I know they're in the shadow of Real Madrid and to a lesser extent Atletico. Uh, but it's not like London where there are a, a dozen professional teams they were the third Madrid team for a long time the potential was there wasn't it for them to have built a stronger club and for for strange reasons they didn't so you know curiously in the end it's it's a little sad uh, to see them go and it looked as though that they were getting out of it but uh, you know obviously defeat on the final day they dropped back into the relegation zone yeah, a team that went out of the relegation zone on the final day was, was Sporting Gijon, thanks to uh, Raya's uh, win against Levante. But obviously Sporting needed the win to go above them if Tafe lost, and they managed to do it against Villarreal. Now, there's, there's been a bit of controversy here. Um, obviously, Villarreal's manager, Marcelino, is, is a fan of Sporting. Um, and there was, a, there was a few words in the way he said that he, he would have liked to see Sporting stay up, and obviously that's what happened because of the win. I mean, what's your view on the whole controversy that's occurred? Yeah, I mean, it's it's beyond controversy, isn't it? I think it's just uh, damn right wrong. Um, the you know to qualify what I previously said, um, I'm a fan of La Liga. I'm an advocate of people watching La Liga, but I'm not a cheerleader. It was it, it, I don't like the way they do the end of the season. There is a cultural thing for years. What you had with these things, the the, the suitcase payments, where a team in Villarreal situation, nothing to play for, last day against a team with something to play for, other teams would pay them to play properly. I think. It's, it's it's a crazy thing. Uh, looking from from our, and there is a cultural difference, but I, I basically I like our culture uh, in Britain that uh, the culture is that you play as as hard as you can, as long as you can for the for the whole of the season. Whereas in Spain there is it's very much a thing that oh there's nothing in it for you. It means more to them. Maybe you shouldn't try as hard. Uh, it's never been as obvious though as uh, the manager coming out beforehand and saying I don't want Sporting Gijón to go down. It's just, it just, it's just crazy. You can't help losing a little bit of respect uh, for a team. I know they didn't lose a league place over it, uh, but it's so disrespectful, ultimately, to Rea Vaicano, because had Villarreal won that game, Rea Vaicano would have survived. So I just, I, I can't get myself in the, that mentality of Marcelino of saying, oh, well, we don't want to get Sporting Gijon relegated, because therefore you are saying, I do want to get Rea Vaicano relegated. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it is. It's it, for me, it's frustrating as well because I like I like Sporting anyway, and it, it tarnishes the the turnaround they've had. Obviously, Villarreal were already in in a, in a bad patch of form. Um, so even if they hadn't have have come out with those words, which shed some light on what might have occurred, but I think that Sporting might have even got a result anyway because because they're on a good upturn yeah. of form and, and Villarreal weren't. And it's it's a shame that it's tarnished the the survival yeah. of, of of Sporting. But so, we'll never know, will we? Because of yeah. what he said and because of the team he picked. Whereas, yeah, I agree with you. Um, and also, the momentum was with Sporting a little bit, wasn't it? And it did mean more to them. And so there is a natural human tendency to drop off a bit. So, but dropping off a bit and the manager saying he didn't want to win the game, <laughs> yeah. oh, it's a crucial difference. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Um, OK, so if, if we look just forwards to, to next season, obviously there's only so much we can, we can say without knowing transfers and stuff to come in. But what are your sort of expectations for the season to come? Um, top three will remain the top three uh, in, in various orders. You, obviously, if I was a bookmaker laying odds, I'd start with Barcelona as, as the favourites because um, they have been so strong over the last couple of seasons. Um, they, they are an ageing team. So a bit of work to do there for, for Barcelona to get that sorted out. There are the, the, the question marks against uh, Real Madrid's ability to, to really to build a squad, to build an 11. Uh, we don't know what will happen with Isco. We don't know what will happen yet with James. So there are, they've probably got 
slightly bigger challenges than Barcelona to rebuild. Atletico are in a strong position uh, as long as they keep the core of that team uh, together. Might add a centre forward in if they're able to with the transfer ban, then they will be back. Um, you, the, the team that you would hope for some kind of recovery is Valencia. That's that's probably the most interesting story to look at over the summer, isn't it? Who will be their coach and how much they will re- rework their squad? Yeah, yeah, certainly agree. Um, any any thoughts of who might go down from anyone established in in the league? Um, well, you never know, do you? We don't we don't know who's going up yet, do we? So yeah. uh, um, the that's always a possibility. Although the the promoted club survived uh, this season, so there's certainly not a massive gap between the bottom half of La Liga and the, the top half of the Segunda. Uh, Granada will survive on the last day, you would imagine, as ever. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, momentum would say Eibar and Deportivo will be in trouble. Uh, Espanyol, new coach, money to spend. In theory, they should be going up the league. Who knows? Also, but new coach as well at uh, Real Betis, because Poyet, an old colleague of ours, is going there. There is, uh, you know, once again, there's going to be a lot of change coming up over this summer. Yeah. Um, obviously, last time we spoke, I set you a challenge of making a team with £30 million using the transfer market website. This time, in, in hipsterish form, I've gone for another 11 to build. This time, it's, it's a team of the season, as we're at the end of the season. But more of the underrated players you didn't really feel got the credit towards the end of the season as you may have liked. So, do you want to hit me with it? Well, yeah, although I might need a, a little bit of guidance on this. I've got a few... Under- it depends on your definition of underrated, doesn't it? Yeah. Because I've got a few in. For example, underrated by the world at large, I would say Busquets and Rakitic. But I guess you're not going to let me put them in a, an underrated 11. Um, I, I wouldn't say so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, other players, similar bracket. I think Felipe Luis is underrated at the world yeah. at large. Saul, Krakowiak. But again, I think they're very highly rated within Spain and, and by by the hipster community, so I, I don't suppose I'm going to get them. There are other players who I think are underrated by their own coach, Hammers this season, player the midfielder of the season last year and yeah. not in the team this year. Uh, Isco the same. Llorente, Fernando Llorente at uh, Sevilla, who we saw come on, was halfway through extra time last yeah. night. Maddening. He was too good a player to be a bit part player at Sevilla. Same kind of play anchor in some ways. So. Yep, yep, yep. Good call. And Oliver Torres, likewise. I think there's just so many good midfielders at Atletico. But... So I've gone for smaller names, essentially. Um, it's not easy because uh, a lot of the, the smaller players will have, have been, you know, the, sorry, the underrated players have been picked up and moved on. But I've got Adan in goal for Betis. Brilliant saves. He, he, now, if you want to, to you can put a, a, a mistake video together of Adan. He's made a couple. Um, and so I don't think he's going to get a move to a big club. I think he'll probably hit Betis again next season. So Adan, the goalkeeper from Betis. I've got a couple of Malaga defenders in there. I've got Roberto Rosales, the right back. And I've got Wellington in there because, uh, as I said earlier, just remarkable achievement, really, that he's still going that strongly. I've got Bernardo from Sporting. We've got a couple of Sporting players in. Bernardo was injured for the second half of the season. Um, I think he, well, he is out of contract. They were lining up a, a big money move. They were hoping to get him. His agent was hoping to get him into a Premier League club for a lot of money. Um, or in terms of wages, uh, got a cruciate knee ligament injury, so they, they missed him for the second half of the season. I've gone Trebolinas at Sevilla. I think it's quite difficult to to really impress at Sevilla because they chop and change their team so much and because you end up sharing your position. So I've got uh, Trebolinas at left back. I've got Victor Camarasso, who was relegated with Levante, but again, too good a player to be in and out of that Levante team. I found that extraordinary because last year he was being linked with the likes of a move to Sevilla. So if I was, uh, you know, if I was a top end Championship, bottom end Premier League club. I think you pick up Victor Camarasa for on, really on the cheap. Uh, Ducore, who was signed uh, on loan, I think he's going back to Watford next season. Or they, 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 he was signed from Wren, never went to Watford. It's one of those complicated ones, obviously at Granada. Um, but he, he really helped them survive. Strong, solid centre midfielder. I've got Keiko from Abar down the right. Abar faded a little bit, as did Deportivo. So I think when you sent me that, putting together a, a cheap team. Challenge. Um, Abar and Deportivo really dominated it. They both faded. Uh, I've got Zura Tuta um, from Sociedad. Again, really good player who hasn't figured that much just in his coach's eyes. Obviously, doesn't particularly rate him. I've got Agareche um, on the basis of uh, underrated by the world at large. Obviously, had a brilliant purple patch early in the season. An injury hit second half of the season. Um, fingers crossed that he's going to be fully fit for them next season. And I've got Carlos Castro, uh, 20, maybe 21 now. Uh, speedy striker from Sporting, another one who is baffling that he wasn't picked by Abelardo nearly as much as he should have been. They should have had uh, Sanabria and Castro up front, and I think they'd have scored a lot more goals, and it wouldn't have been such a controversial uh, last-ditch survival for Sporting. 
Fair play. The last time, I didn't get any of yours. <laughs> this time, I got three. All so right. Who, who did you group. have? I agreed with Adan in goal. Right, um, okay, yeah. right back, Rosales. Um, right, yeah. Centre-backs, I went for Bailey of, of Villarreal. All oh, right, okay. And San Jose of Athletic uh, Bilbao. Yeah. Um, Left-back, I went Juncker of, of Ibar. Yeah. Um, a midfield three of Camacho, Benega, and uh, I agreed with Zeratuza. And front three, Oriana, Baston from Abar and Jonathan Vieira at Las Palmas. Right, yes. Yeah, uh, Jonathan Vieira, a really good, really good shout, actually, because, um, yeah, it's worth a very close look at uh, Las Palmas. Probably the biggest uh, overachievers, aren't they? Finishing 11th mm. and finishing well clear, well, I suppose six points clear. Uh, but they, were, they weren't in relegation trouble in the last few weeks of the season. So th- they did brilliantly, yeah. Uh, Camacho, the reason I didn't put Camacho and, and Banega in is that they're on the radar. Uh, it's that it's the definition of unfated, oh, isn't it? Because um, <laughs> Benega could it, it looks like he's 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 off to sign for Inter, doesn't it? In yeah, the, yeah. In the summer, so I, I was thinking, you know, can can he re, can he still be underrated if he's going to mm. go and sign some massive contract with with Inter and Camacho? I think Premier League clubs are on to Camacho. It'll be a battle to hang on to him. Yeah, from what I've heard, he has a really low buyout clause as well, which is which could be interesting. But yes. uh, and it's it's funny you said about Camarasa because I thought he was someone severe really could have gone for, seeing as they're losing Benega. So it's it's, it's sort of a good replacement but um, moving away from La Liga um, we've got the European Championships uh, this summer um, obviously Spain will want to re- take revenge of their, their awful performances in the World Cup that, that has been previously um, on the squad itself Torres was an omission that I didn't really uh, omission rather I didn't really expect because of his, his last f- uh, few matches the form that he performed with was, was really quite excellent and, and really did highlight some of the, the matches we've seen him play years and years ago for the likes of Liverpool and it's, it's a shame for me he didn't get in I mean what are what your thoughts and also on Costa as well who didn't make it as well Yeah there, there's a, an irony isn't there about Torres because he was picked for squads when he was out of form he suddenly rediscovered his form probably only April and May wasn't it he had a fantastic last six weeks of the season I think if you'd asked anyone in in the middle of March whether Torres would go to the Euros, they'd have, they'd have thought you would, you would you would it was crazy talk, um, and also whether he would have stayed on Atletico. But his form towards the end of the season was magnificent. Uh, would I have had him in? I don't know. I think Morata is the man uh, for for Spain. Uh, I think he's been a bit underused this season for for Juve. When I have seen him play, I think he's been excellent. Um, I think it's a blessing that Diego Costa wasn't fit, and so it was a, an easy one to leave him out of the squad because he just hasn't fitted in. He wasn't the man for Spain. It was a it was a mistake. It wasn't the World Cup um, defeat. Wasn't all his fault, was it? There were various other problems. Um, they do lack a little bit of pace, and so Morata will uh, hopefully add a little bit. Uh, will go some way to repairing that. Pedro is in there as well for his pace. Disappointing season overall, though. You know they're, they're brilliant, and and mm. you know, it, it would be silly to, to discount them and say that they won't retain their trophy. I know people love France, and I know Germany is strong, but you know. Spain are potential winners. Yeah. Do you think this is the tournament where you see David De Gea starting in goal over Casillas? Oh, surely, surely. You know, that that would be the other change I'd, I'd have made to the squad. I wouldn't have had Casillas in the squad. Uh, I think you've just got to move on. He didn't have a particularly good season with Porto. Left out of the Porto team at times, much criticised by Porto fans and journalists in Portugal. Um, yeah, I mean that that is that's you know, taking loyalty a step too far. Still having Casillas in. Yeah, uh, another player I wanted to talk about was was Bruno. Uh, obviously, he's had an excellent season at Villarreal, a really combative midfielder. Um, he's getting on in age a bit now, so it's it's nice to see him get some credit and, and put into the Spanish squad. Do you think you could see him getting some some minutes in the game? Because obviously, there's a, a huge wealth of talent in that midfield. Yeah, I, I would guess not. I think he's there. He sort of adds a bit of versatility. As he's got older, he's not quite the versatile player because he played. I remember him playing left back for for Villarreal, so he would have been a bit of cover. Slightly surprising. You know, you know that um, that is probably his day is probably gone, and now he's in the squad. There were probably other younger players that could have figured. He has been a tremendous player, hasn't he? He, he should have played for Real Madrid for a lot of years. I think they'd have won more trophies because he is that defensive holding midfield player. But they've got San Jose in there who does that job as well. Also, will be cover for the central defenders. But it's obviously it's Busquets' position, isn't it? And he and he does it superbly. So uh, my guess would be. A great, a superb player though, Bruno Soriano is. I don't think we'll we'll see him play. Okay. Um, in terms of their group, obviously they've got Turkey, the Czech Republic, and Croatia. Which one of those do you see creating the most and uh, more problems for for the Spanish side? Oh, well, Croatia should be a good team, shouldn't they? They've got uh, very strong players, aren't they? Brilliant. You know, if, if you look at Rakitic and and Modric, two central midfielders as strong as anyone's really. 
So uh, they they will be they will be a threat. Spain should get through that group, but you know you never know, do you? Uh, you know it, it's there is always a little bit of a random element about these major tournaments because you can have a couple of unlucky games, can't you? And you could be out of a tournament, and so uh, they're, they're not nailed on to go through. But yes, Spain and Croatia to go through is that's my guess. Okay. Uh, final player from the Swain so I want to focus on was, was Sal, who got a, a call up from Atletico. Obviously, it, it bucks the trend, which is something I want to ask you about in a minute, in terms of the, the really quite younger players getting into the Spain squad. Um, what do you do? You think he'll get a game in the same sort of deep position, or will he be out wide in, in terms of the position he's played for Atletico on that right hand side? Uh, I think he will. They don't set up the same, do they? Uh, he's no. a versatile player. Uh, I think he is a, a massive part of the future. Of, of Spain. He's also versatile. It's, I know it's a while since we've been, seen him play in defence, but he did for Rayo Vicano. So bear in mind, they are a little bit light in those positions and that Javi Martinez isn't there, which is a shame. Um, so he's, he's, he's useful backup. Um, he's, a, he's a tremendous player. The goal that he scored in the Champions League against Bayern isn't the kind of player he is. It shows you what, he, what ability he does have, but he is he's a tough, hardworking, um, sensible, takes up good positions, works hard. Classic Simeone, Atletico Madrid player. He's a big part of the future. Um, yes, yeah. So this, this this could be this could be the one where we see him breaking breaking through into the team. I don't know, but because Del Bosque is a bit on the conservative side, isn't he? Yeah. Okay. So what I wanted, the last part I wanted to speak to you about was um, the actual national system in the way that they select players because it's something that really grinds my gears with England. Um, it's the way they they separate the youth system and and then the, the, the full national team, which is so in England I feel a bit guilty. They call up players too soon, in my opinion. They should let them flourish in, in the under twenty ones and, and whatnot. And the likes we've seen Deli Ali come through, which a lot of people would argue deserves to be in, in the side of the performances put through in the Premier League this season. But there's other players. But in terms of Spain, obviously we've seen we've seen great performances from the likes of Denis Suarez and, and Yaki Williams, uh, Fertit Bilbao. Is it and Bellerin, obviously Arsenal's been a great right back for them. Who who do you think or what is the reason rather why England chooses to, to call these youngsters up so quickly and Spain decides to separate it more? Um, because in England we don't have respect for those underage tournaments, do we? As as Premier League clubs show they pull their players out of those the likes of the world under twenties, the under twenty one championships. And I think it's a mistake. Um, if you speak to Stuart Pearce about this, he found it mightily frustrating being the England under-21 coach because he never thought that there was respect for the tournaments. And I think that is shown out. When England go to tournaments, classically, I remember in Capello um, going to the World Cup and just being massive discontent within the, the ranks of the, the players because no one quite knew how to manage themselves through um, that, that, that amount of time away from your family how much time do you relax? How much time are you focused? How intense can you be over such a long period of time? And on all of those things that there's a, a core of the Spanish players have been doing since the under-17s because they went to the World Cups and European Championships. They took them properly. They, they did it really well. It's not the only reason that Spain have, have been successful because they keep on producing players for various other reasons that you know, would take too long to go into. But the respect that they have shown to the youth tournaments is definitely a factor in their players making the transition. Now, obviously, some of them drop by the wayside because it's just the numbers tell you they're going to. The likes of Adrian Lopez was a big, big player for the for the youth, uh, the under the underage squads, and Delafeu as well. And if they don't do it when they move into uh, full age football, then they will drop by the wayside. But a, a lot of the players that won the major trophies for Spain. You look back, and they were the core of teams that had won youth international international events along the way. Yeah, yeah, certainly agree. Um, final question then: predicted finish for Spain in the Euros? Uh, oh, I, you know what? I'm going I'm to be confident on their behalf. I'm going to say they'll go all the way, so ret- retain their trophy. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> okay, well, it's been an absolute pleasure interviewing you again, John. Um, I, I don't know if we've improved on on the quality since the last one we did, but uh, I've certainly enjoyed it, um, and I will certainly welcome you back again. No, you know, it's, it's a pleasure, Tom, and uh, good work with the hipsters and keep it all going. Thank you very much. Um, so there's nothing much else to say except just to say that please check out our other podcast and interviews we'll be doing plenty over the summer, including, well, as Chris is, is going to try and make me do daily podcasts and covering the Euro matches, which I'm trying to get out of, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> I'll see how busy I am. But uh, thank you for listening. Uh, in the immortal words of Chris, um, keep your beard strong and your glasses trendy. This has been the Football Hipsters Podcast. Thank <laughs> you.